Good evening, welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Welcome to everyone who's joining us here and welcome to everyone who's joining us online. Uh, tonight we continue on with our series. Uh, it's called The Apostle Paul. We're reading from the book of Acts and we're also reading from this novel called Paul, written by Walter Wongren Jr. And it's probably uh, a good thing for me to say to you, the, the novel is not meant to be a picture-perfect replica of the Bible. It's designed to make us think and to bring to life the life and times. And so it's scripturally based, but it's not actually scripture. So I just pray that you understand that as we teach from it and you enjoy what uh, Walter has to offer. Uh, tonight's lesson <coughs> is actually probably a difficult title. It says Jews versus Gentiles, and it's meant in the kindest way because it's actually talking about these times when the church first formed and it did, it separated the Jews and the Gentiles uh, in a strange way because they'd always been separated, but of course now they were coming together, but uh, particularly the Jewish people were finding it very difficult with the ceremonial laws on how to integrate with Gentile people because the laws actually forbid them to be together. Now, also in conjunction with this, as it says, Jews versus, it has Peter versus Gentiles, uh, we have Paul. So Peter went out and championed uh, the Jews in the early church, and of course Paul went out and championed the Gentiles. And so this brought them on opposite sides of their arguing a lot of the time. And uh, as it mentions here, uh, it says in Jerusalem, because they came together and they met in Jerusalem. And this image up here is a representation of what it would have looked like with their dialogue and their arguing uh, between one another. So this is the 11th lesson. Uh, as I said, we're going to continue reading from both the Bible and the novel Paul. Uh, <coughs> in the Bible, we're reading from the book of Acts. And of course, we're looking at the life of what was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, whom we now know as the Apostle Paul. When he returned to Jerusalem, as I just mentioned, he returned with Barnabas, another apostle, who had left the church in Jerusalem to join him on his first mission trip. And they enter into a, an argument or a robust dialogue about the ceremonial laws surrounding the traditional separation of Jews from Gentiles. So in this lesson, um, it continues with the same topic as the previous lesson, but I'm going to go into the story of Peter at this point in time, which I haven't been into prior, uh, because at this point in time, because it's referenced in the book, in the novel, Paul, uh, I'm going to bring it up in the scriptures so we can actually have a look at what happened with Peter and the fact that he was actually exposed to an understanding in a vision that what you eat doesn't make you unclean and nor does salvation come from circumcision. And so these were big issues in the day. And I know in the church today, some of these things still continue to be an issue. We have many Jews in the world today who are <coughs> accepting Jesus as their Messiah. And of course, there's still Jewish people who believe in Jesus. And so they are still Jews, which means they still practice their ceremonial laws from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant, but accept Jesus in the New Covenant. And so this is still as relevant today as it was back then. So to learn what happens, we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 10, verse 1, through to Acts chapter 11, verse 18. And we're going to be reading pages 149 to 162 from the novel Paul by Walter Wongeren Jr. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to commence in this lesson reading uh, from the novel Paul first. So we're going to go to page 149, which is titled James. So it's written from the viewpoint of the apostle James, and it begins, <coughs> excuse me, with chapter 27 on page 149. And as I said, this is from the, 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 the perspective of James. So he says, In me there is a memory fixed, a single scene so stark and grave, that whenever it seizes my mind, I gasp and grieve all over again. 
It signifies the beginning of separations within the church. At the time of this scene's reality, however, I thought it but a passing problem, a serious problem to be sure, one that could have elemental consequences if not solved, but solvable with all and confined to a small circle inside the church. And of course, today we know that this wasn't the case. In fact, I was more fearful of the broader assaults from without, both upon our people, the Jews, and upon the body of believers who bore the glory of Jesus for the Jews. This lesser rift within our fellowship I reckon dangerous in so far as it weakened our unity in the face of these assaults. Solvable, I said, maybe it were truer to say dismissible. My real effort, I'm afraid, was simple to get rid of the problem. I wasn't patient enough, I was angry, and my thoughtlessness led to solutions of terrible paradox, divide to unify, and to survive divide. Here is the scene. Saul, the anti-Pharisee, is standing head and shoulders above everyone else in the assembly room in Mary's house, flapping his arms like a rooster, stretching his neck and crowing and crowing. He's standing on a bench. He's arguing with ferocity and a perverted delight against other Pharisees in the faith who shout as loud as he does, but failingly, since they are several and he is but one single blood-red voice. And he's causing such outrage in his debaters, such emotional divisions, that other believers must be wondering whether choosing Jesus is only the first of a series of decisions. We're on page 150. Saul... That bandy-legged rooster, he's a rooster now, strutting on a bench like a cockwalk crowing, this is the man I had honoured, once a quick, convincing student of Torah. This is the one I thought would give Barnabas wisdom, stability, gravitas. Here he was, the king of tumult, shamelessly turned good men into beasts. That scene was troubling to everyone there, but to me it was confirmation of disappointment for I had heard of the changes in him, but now my eye was seeing them. And you can see from what James is saying, he's depicting Paul or as he was Saul in the past. And one of the things that happens in life is that when something happens to us and we change, mm-hmm. other people don't want to let us be that new person. <laughs> so, of course, he had an encounter with Jesus himself. It changed who he was and what he believed completely. And yet here we have other people not allowing him to have the conviction of his own faith. Mm. So Saul, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So I set my jaw, moved through the turmoil toward the northern corner of the house. So they were in this house, in this scene, and they were communicating, as, as mentioned when we uh, began. And he says, Barnabas, I said, shut up. This is an iniquitous excess. He, his mouth caught open in some word, glanced at me. I didn't wait for his obedience. So, of course, Barnabas, uh, sorry, Barsabas, I beg your pardon. Barsabas had been a person who had stood on the opposite side of Paul and he had refuted everything that Paul chose to stand for. I left him. I went first to Simon, then to John and asked them to follow and walk out of the house I hoped that our departure would deflate the passions and grant the people the right to go. In a near corner of the courtyard, I noticed the large form of Joseph Barnabas. He was not inside the house, fighting on Saul's behalf. He was outside in the grey of the rainfall, kneeling, consoling young Rhoda. So we heard this mention of this young girl in the previous lesson. Come to think of it, Barnabas had not even joined the debate. The great bearded Levite had drawn a child to his bosom and was, I think, singing softly in her ear. Barnabas, I said, Simon and John paused behind me and looked at him. Barnabas, when Saul is able to hear you, invite him to Simon's house. We are going there now and I will wait for you. Come, talk privately with us at Simon's house. We called it Simon's house by habit, I suppose, Ever since he'd escaped Agrippa's prison and fled Jerusalem, the church had changed the use of the place. 
We made it an inn for pilgrim believers, those who came to keep the feasts. We taught and studied in small groups here. We shelved one room like a library for our books, the scriptures, letters the saints had written from abroad. Nevertheless, when he entered the house that afternoon, Simon Peter expanded as if it were still his home. And when Saul and Barnabas arrived, it was Simon who led us into the dining room. So I've asked you that question, where is Simon Peter's home? It's um, It's in? Jerusalem. Ka? Per? Capernaum. 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 Yes. And we haven't got to this, so I'm going to give you a bit of insight what Capernaum means. Uh, Do you remember? Uh, it means the city of Nahum. Uh, Nahum, who is one of the prophets of the Old Testament. Nahum is a short version name for Nehemiah. Okay, so what we find here is that he was born in the city of Nehemiah, which is what we know as Capernaum to this day, which is on the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Fishing, fishing town. A fishing Been town. Absolutely. And when Saul and Barnabas arrived, it was Simon who led us into the dining room, taking the host position at the central table of three. So yes, if you actually go to Capernaum, the relic, the remains of his house is still there. In fact, they've built a synagogue over the top of it. Mm. And so it's still there today to go and see. Uh, Saul went immediately to the table at Simon's right. Barnabas followed him. John and I had no choice but to sit at Simon's left, directly across from the Pharisee and the Levites. We ate supper together. Simon's wife served. He had not, as I had suggested, left her behind in Caesarea, but as things evolved, I was grateful to have her here. Her presence had a civilizing effect on Saul. Even as we were sitting down, the man restated his position with a lunging further, saying, there's no reason to circumcise Titus. So this is what we are talking about last lesson, about the circumcision, because Titus was a Greek boy, and he was uncircumcised, and yet he had received the Holy Spirit. And so Saul had brought him with him to demonstrate to the others that this Gentile lad had received the Holy Spirit and it had nothing to do with circumcision. Mm. That's right. So it reads on, Then if you demand it, you add to the gospel Jesus revealed to me. And if you add to his gospel, you judge it insufficient. But Jesus is sufficient. We will not circumcise Titus. Just then, Simon's wife entered the dining room with towels and bowls of water and Saul tripped in the midst of his speech. Oh, he said, he gave the intruder a quick glance, almost turned back to talk, then peered closely at the woman behind him. It's you, he cried. Peter, your wife is here. The little man bounded to his feet, seized the bowls from her hands and set them on the table and grinning like a boy, kissed her. How good to see you again, he took the towels from her arms. Why, I haven't seen you in what, 14 years? Here in this very room, wasn't it? So this tells you uh, that there's a, a reuniting after such a long time since before the time when Jesus first called them away. She smiled upon him with a kindly gravity. Yes, exactly as if he were a boy. You're older, she said, and battered, poor man. She raised the tips of her fingers to the air above his brow. You have new scars, so obviously you must have old ones as well. She said, then she retrieved her towels, laid them each by a water bowl and left the room. Her gesture had a remarkable effect. When he sat down again, Saul's eye had turned inward, softening his face. As for me, my eyes were opened. How could I not have seen the thick, worm-like welt at his hairline and the lesser scoring of white scars across his temple and cheekbone? Suddenly, I too was remembering that time seven and seven years ago when three of us had gathered here and eaten together and Simon's wife had served. John said, where Peter goes, there goes Miriam. Simon said, except to prison, except to prison. The woman returned with a wide platter carrying clay bowls and a steaming pot of lentil soup. She set her service down at Simon's right he watched as she ladled thick soup into Saul's bowl. Then he said, 
I'm not going to fight you, Saul. Don't look for a fight from me. Maybe I'll argue with James instead. He dipped his fingers in the water bowl and dried them on a towel. He looked at me. Saul made the pressure on the half James, he said, but the point was put to me several years ago by the Holy Spirit. Saul's just driving home the will of the Spirit that God no longer shows partiality. Anyone who fears him and does what is right, no matter the race or the nation, is acceptable to him. I felt heat in my face. I know that, I said. I've always known that. I'm not disputing that. Now Simon was receiving his soup at the hand of his wife. He said, I've seen the Holy Spirit poured out on others as it was on this boy today, on Roman folk, on the uncircumcised James, and the Lord himself commanded me to reject no one. His wife moved to John, sitting at my right. Simon, listen to me, I said. This is not the dispute. I am not rejecting anyone. I never have. She came to me now and began to ladle my soup. She smiled, but formally, it has ever been my station in life neither to seek nor to receive the more intimate friendships of women. I nodded, acknowledging the greeting. I restrained myself too by the cords of formality. Remember, this is from the point of view of James. Mm. It's not the rejection, I said, but the reception that's in question. How we ought to receive those whom we receive, straight away by baptism? Apart from Moses and the wide of the doors of Israel. Simon's wife walked softly from the room. My voice rose a minimal degree, but my form and my countenance remained absolutely fixed. Do you want to allow that? And if you do, won't you seem to preach two paths to salvation? It's not only unreasonable, how can it be possible? What? You would make the Jewish Messiah into a Christ for the Greeks? Simon answered me, is Jesus divided? While I spoke, he raised his hands palm upward, likely to utter thanksgiving before we ate, but I kept talking. Saul refuses additions to the gospel that he preaches to the Gentiles. I said, but they're adding, and there's taking away too. It is written, give heed to the statutes which I teach you, and do them, that you may go in and take possession of the land. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it. So these are the words of the Israelites before they entered into the land of Canaan, as it was at the time. But Saul, the refuser of additions, himself does more than subtract some small portion of the law. He cancels Torah altogether. So these are really, really strong words. I mean, they're seeing him as someone who's completely uh, you know, banished the Old Testament, as we would call it, uh, the Torah altogether. And of course, that's not the case. Saul jumped on my word. For this one and for that one, but not for everyone, he said, looking me dead level in the eye. For Titus, for Gentiles, because the Lord Jesus is all in all and all sufficient. But not for the Jews, James, he snapped. You're the one who hasn't been listening. Listen to me. Torah is Torah, sound and good for the Jew. And Jesus is both Messiah and Christ, because Jesus fulfills both the law and the screaming need of the world. No, no, Jesus is not divided. But if you require of Titus an adherence to Jesus and also to the laws of Moses, then Jesus is diminished and it is heaven itself that you have divided. Joseph Barnabas spoke. Saul, eat something, he said. He had himself been eating, but he set his spoon down now and looked at me. The works of God are proofs of the presence of God and his approval, Barnabas says. So he's making it quite clear that if someone has received the Holy Spirit and the works of the Holy Spirit are coming through that person, then that is good enough. Mm. Right? I did not move. I set my jaw. I returned his look with my own most immovable look. And he said, God has given Saul signs and one and power. How tired Barnabas seemed, but the man never had the tensile endurance of a good warrior. Too much fondness, too much tenderness. He could not sustain his gaze at me. He dropped his eyes, then looked at Simon and said, 
I remember when you and John healed a cripple, a beggar, in the temple gate. You said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you in the name of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, walk. He did. The man leaped up and praised God. Peter, John, in the name of Jesus, Saul, has done this very same thing in foreign lands. In cities where there are no synagogues, people are amazed. They listen. They believe. They glorify God. It's the same Jesus in Lystra as in Jerusalem, and the same salvation. It works. Saul is right. This gospel is sufficient. And you can sort of see why there's a big divide in Christians today, because there's so many that say, I only read the New Testament, I don't need the Old. Yeah, yeah. Because you can see this, the parent of this argument all the way back in this time. Mm. So James goes on to say, I said, Barnabas, look at me. Do you wish therefore to abolish the law? It's been our fortress since Moses. Without it, we would have perished a thousand times over. But with it, we've survived Assyria and Babylon and Persia and Alexander and the Ptolemies and the Seleucids and Rome abolish the law and we will surely perish. Saul said, so what? The Lord is coming soon. Mm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Fighting words, hey? Mm. <laughs> and the Lord requires his servants to work until he comes. Kill the law, kill us now, but in fact we have no such choice. We must watch and strive for righteousness until that day when righteousness himself appears. No, we strive for righteousness on account of that great and terrible day of the Lord. Mm. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Simon's wife hovering in the doorway. I pressed my lips together. Suddenly Simon was shouting heartily, Eat, eat what my wife has prepared. Obviously they're all arguing so much, she's put all this food on the table <laughs> and they're letting it go cold. <laughs> but Saul fairly flew over the table crying, Strive, strive, let everyone strive for righteousness. Beg everyone to walk in the light, but don't hinder my gospel or blame it or undermine it. I am called to preach to the Gentiles. I will not run in vain. Simon Peter picked up a small loaf of bread and astonishingly threw it at Saul. So, so who calls Saul, or Paul as it is now, to preach to the Gentiles? Who? Yeah, who? Jesus. Jesus himself. That's right. And so if he was to stand in any other way, yep. he would be defying the call of the Lord upon his life. Mm. And so obviously he's going to stand for this. Yeah. So with the breadstick, goes back and hit his left ear, and the little Pharisee exhaled and the sound of an ox blowing. The woman in the doorway uttered a bark of delight, then covered her mouth. Barnabas, on the other hand, sucked air and threw back his head and erupted in laughter, long and loud and sustained. The big man grabbed his sides to laugh, Simon being pleased with himself, John to my right giggled, I held my peace. Simon is a spontaneous bore and the people love him for it. Simon said, shut up Saul, eat your soup, dip the bread in the soup, then wipe the bowl clean with it and for once let someone else speak on your behalf. Saul cast a glance backward at Simon's wife, whose eyes were positively twinkling. Barnabas came forward with somewhat more appetite than he'd shown before. John picked up his spoon and Peter, tearing off a hunk of bread and stuffing into his mouth, began to speak. And this is where, I'm just going to read this bit and then we're going to turn over to the Bible. He says, when Miriam and I were staying in Joppa, which is also known as Jaffa, which is today's Tel Aviv in Israel, the day before we went to Caesarea, I had a vision, he said. At noon, I was on the rooftop praying. I got very hungry, then fell into a trance. I saw the heavens open up. I saw something like a huge sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. When it landed, I saw all kinds of reptiles inside and birds and four-footed beasts, some clean, some unclean. And then I heard a voice say, Peter, rise and kill and eat. I said, no, Lord, I have never eaten anything common or unclean, but the voice said, what God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. James, that happened three times, he says. Three times the sheep came down, three times I was commanded, and three times I refused to eat on account of the law. Mm. Then the sheep was taken back up to heaven, and I woke up baffled 
by the vision. And so at this point, we'll shift over and we'll go to Acts chapter 10 in the Bible. We're going to read from verse 1 through to Acts chapter 11, verse 18. So again, that's Acts chapter 10, verse 1, through to Acts chapter 11, verse 18. It reads, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius. Now Caesarea is at the northern, towards the northern end of the coast of Israel. It's very close to what's called Haifa today, which is uh, uh, to the the west of the Sea of Galilee, so up in the northern end. Uh, so again, at his area, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. Again, I'm going to interrupt that. Caesarea was a place where the Romans built. King Herod built a palace there called the Coral Palace. They had a hippodrome, which is where they raced the chariots, and they basically executed both Jews and Christians there. They also had a huge amphitheatre there, for all of the Roman sports. And so it was a large center of activity for the Roman legions. And of course it was a port from which they would sail and receive soldiers and goods. Yeah. Verse two, he and his all his family were devout and God fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God, which tells us what? That God sees what we do. Mm -hmm. So he says, A memorial offering before God. Verse 5 Now send men to Joppa, or Jaffa as we call it today, to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And so I have a couple of pictures of the front door of his house in Israel. You're about to see a handsome young man, and his name is, when it opens, I had a beautiful picture of Roger standing in front of the door. Uh, but here, yeah. So this is the door back in the day. There's actually a door that fills in here now. And it's written above the door, it says Simon the Tanner. But at the time, they had the well here for this uh, city of Jaffa. Mm. And here's the stairs that went up on top of the roof of the building where Peter has his vision. Mm -hmm. And so it says here, uh, various Christian traditions, because this is obviously written um, by Jewish people in Israel for the purpose of tourism. So it says Christian traditions tell the story of Simon the Tanner. So this plaque's actually there no. at the door. Yeah. The Tanner, who lived in his house and hosted Pete, the Apostle here. So it must be an Aussie. <laughs> Pete, the Apostle. <laughs> it was here that Peter raised Tabitha from the dead and saw his famous vision in which he was commanded to eat animals regarded as unclean in Jewish tradition. Jewish. Notice how they would use the words tradition. Mm. When he refused, he heard a voice saying, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. So we read that in Acts chapter 10, verse 15. Yeah. Peter interpreted his vision as divine permission to forego the Jewish commandments and to preach Christianity to Jews and pagans alike. This was a historic turning point in which Christianity evolved from what was considered an esoteric sect of Judaism to a worldwide religion. So you notice that? Mm. Mm. Christianity was originally seen as an esoteric sect of Judaism. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they called it the Jesus Movement. Yeah. Right? Because Jesus was moving throughout the land and they too, the Essenes there, saw Jesus as a Jewish man who was the leader of a sect. Mm. And so we see all the way through to today, this is mentioned. It's wonderful because they actually prepared to document what happened, um, but it's from a it's written, obviously, there in Israel at the actual door. Yeah. Okay, so going back to the scripture, verse 7. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. 
He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Now the next part is about Peter's vision. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. So there's that picture behind you. Peter, uh, so he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for, why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next portion of scripture comes under a titling of Peter at Cornelius' house. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. And so we can see the, how complex it is. I mean, how do you minister to both groups of people when they're not even allowed to come together in the same room? Mm -hmm. Hence all of the arguing. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell me. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. The meaning of the word? Blessing, to be blessed. Bless you. The Lord be with you. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, which of course is a word for the cross because it was made from wood. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. 
While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptised with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. And this is the scripture which has been taken completely out of context in modern churches. And there is people out there who say that you're only baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you don't, you're actually not a Christian. What a very sad situation. The scripture makes it clear that the reason they baptised in the name of Jesus Christ is because they had already received the Holy Spirit. And so this is a really important scripture uh, today as well. So moving to chapter 11 now, verse 1, Peter explains his actions. It reads, The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticised him and said, You went in the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. So obviously he's breaking all of the the original covenant with Abraham and the ceremonial laws. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, keep, sorry, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord, nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. So this is the three times, third time we've said over this tonight. So I hope that this is really sort of imprinting you to make it very, very clear. Verse nine of chapter 11 from the book of Acts. The voice spoke from heaven, a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And so that tells us that we shouldn't be calling other things unclean or impure mm. if God has created them, because it's not for us to say so. Mm. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them, These six brothers also went with me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and said, sorry, and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. So there's the key message. Then I remember what the Lord had said, John baptized with water but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus. Who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance in life. That's what varies from the previous repetition that I've just read from chapter 10. It says here, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance in life so in other words your repentance doesn't come through circumcision Mm -hmm. it doesn't come from observing ceremonial laws it doesn't come from eating certain foods and not other foods it comes from what comes from god no it comes from You. you and what do you have to do to receive repentance No. What do you have to do? What's repentance all about? Turning from your old ways. Right. So we can say sorry. Mm. We can pray to God and ask for his forgiveness. But repentance means that we actually go the other way. We don't do the same thing again. That's right. And so otherwise everything's just... Waffle. Waffle. That's right. (laughs) Words that aren't matched by your deeds. Mm -hmm. And so true... (laughs) <laughs> so true that's repentance instead of repentance that's right and so true repentance actually doesn't require you to say sorry it requires you to change your ways okay so this message tonight is really fundamentally important to our faith 
and understanding because everybody who is grafted on to the tree, the Jewish tree, isn't grafted on because of their bloodline, because of the, of the ceremonial laws, because of clean or unclean, because of circumcision, etc. They are grafted on by their faith. And that's what we must remember. Okay, so let's return now back to the novel Paul, back to page 155. It's about two thirds of the way down the page, beginning with the words, I said. So again, this is James speaking, and he says, I said, why are you looking at me? Are you telling this story just for me? Simon grinned, and he, come, he came the sense of that vision straight from the Holy Spirit. Right away when I woke, there were three men knocking on the door below. They had come from Caesarea from a centurion of the Italian cohort who had been told by the Lord to come and get me. Now, when you drive to Caesarea in Israel, it's about a 45 minute drive from Jaffa or Joppa. So in these days, as a walking distance, they would have comfortably walked it in one day. Mm. And so when it says they went up, they could have slept in the night, got up early in the morning, and they would have been up there at some time during the next day. So when you go there, you realize it's not so far away. Nothing is. Nothing is, that's right. But it's very comfortable in an air-conditioned car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, where am I? so a Gentile, James, a God-fearing man, a Roman, never circumcised. Yet when we went to his house and when I preached to him the news of Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, I knew that the Holy Spirit fell on his household and everyone there because they began to speak in tongues, praising God. Mm. And so there's evidence, obviously, there for those people who do not believe. James, that was no different from what Saul's boy did today at Mary's house. I couldn't forbid water for baptising that Gentile and his people. They was no, there was no need to circumcise them. So in the previous lesson, we spoke about how Titus began to do what when they were singing and praising to God? He began to speak in tongues, which is the evidence of his receiving of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so reading on, so why should I circumcise? They had already received the Holy Spirit, all people. Simon said to me sententiously, moreover, the ox repeated the phrase, all people, he said, no matter their race or their nation are acceptable to God. And so we could give one message from this lesson, that would be it. All people from all nations are acceptable to God. All people are created in God's image and all people are God's children. Okay? And that's the message that we all need to understand. Mm. Jesus died on the cross for all people, for all nations. Okay? Uh, reading on. You think that, you think I deny that, I said, so James speaking. Well, you have. No, I haven't. Yes, James. Yes, you do. You demand circumcision. You want to make Jews of those that aren't Jews. Only as Jews do you find them acceptable. Simon, what? Is this your intent to isolate me here? No, not at all. Then your intent must be to turn our Jewish traditions, the holy traditions which I uphold, which once that man there himself upheld, into trash. No, of course not. The problem in all of this is that they're not actually trashing what had happened before. No. They're just saying that it's not necessary in the present or going forwards in the future. Mm. And so this is where that challenge is. But that's exactly what you're doing, Simon. I said with energy, and you're, you're rejecting the intentions of the Almighty. The voice in your vision invited you to eat things previously unclean. Perhaps we should therefore receive people previously contaminated. So his typical human nature that starts stretching it previously contaminated and impure i will concede the interpretation but i was leaning forward to drive the point into this big man's mind but that voice the voice of the lord simon never invited you to become an unclean thing yourself the law as it applies to us is still the law and there's the message the law, right? they're not casting it out no. but they're saying that others can join without having to be bound by it. Yeah. Okay. James Saul spoke. It wrenched my head to his direction. Where's the difference between us then, he said. What you ask of Peter, I beg of you. I allow Jews to be Jews. If Simon must keep the law, let Simon keep the law. 
Just don't demand that Gentiles become Jews too. That's the casing point. Instantly, this answer shot through my head. If Simon is eating with Gentiles, then Simon's not keeping the law. But I restrained myself. I folded my hands and tucked my chin into my throat. I was suffering a sudden sense of panic. I needed time to reflect because my mouth had overrun my mind. This, that last statement of mine had in fact shifted my position and Saul had recognised the variance faster than I did. He had leaped on my words and changed the language to his own advantage. The law to us is still the Lord. The law, beg your pardon, I said, with stress on the personal distinction, us. It permitted Saul to extrapolate, but not to Gentiles. Mm. Let Jews be Jews, the man returned my words to me with wondrous generosity, in order, in order also to say, and let Gentiles be Gentiles. In the gap of the conversation, Simon's wife came into the dining room with a plate of cheeses and raisins and olives. She saw how little soup had been consumed, said nothing to break our silence, but withdrew, taking with her the plate still full. At length, John spoke. So this obviously talks about the passion of their communication because they're not interested in the food that's being placed before them. A bit like here, right? (laughs) Everyone's eating in front of me. (laughs) We're not arguing with you. It's easier to agree, you get to eat more when you do. (laughs) At length, John spoke. He had pulled an oil lamp to himself and was cupping the flame between his hands. Firelight played upward on his face. After the glamorous exchange, the man seemed subdued. Well, and of course he would seem so. His first words gave good reason and laid caution to my own tongue. He said, four years ago, my brother was executed outside the walls of this city. I am weak. I should not grieve his death. It was what the Lord had prophesied. He said that we, my brother and I, would drink the cup that he was to drink, but I think about him every day. Who is he talking about? We've already mentioned this. James is actually speaking here. He's speaking about his brother. Which James is this who's speaking? No, this is James, brother of John, son of Zebedee. There's an echo in the room. Yeah, I remember it. So basically, when Jesus first baptised in the Sea of Galilee, he went back after they caught the fishing, the fish in the net, and he went to John and James, who were with the father Zebedee, and called them to come and follow him. So this is the John and James. So James, there's another James, of course, and that's the half-brother of Jesus, son of Joseph. But this is James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee. They were both disciples. Okay, just just so you're clear on that. Mm. And so in this part of the reading, it's talking about the fact that his brother John was the first person, the first of the disciples to be executed by the Romans. Okay, Okay? so that was a few years ago. Uh, It's former... I'll just reread this. <coughs> he said, For four years ago, my brother was executed outside the walls of the city. I am weak. I should not grieve his death. It was what the Lord had prophesied. He said that we, my brother and I, would drink the cup that he was to drink, but I think about him every day. And this, James, is what I think. Why did Agrippa kill him? Because Agrippa was seeking support of the Jews. And he didn't see my brother as a Jew among Jews. He saw him as something different, though we are no different, obviously because they were professing their faith in the Messiah, Jesus. John drew breath, his nostrils distended, but his mouth was solemn. James, he said, this is the predominating problem today, both for us and for Jews in general, that Jews and Jews are divided. It's interesting, isn't it? Because they're arguing about Jews and Gentiles being divided. But the reality is that the Jews themselves Jews. have become divided. In fact, they always have been. Mm. That we seem divided to the world and we are divided internally. Mm. Again, he breathed, gazing into the lamp, the lamp, flame pink through the flesh of his fingers. He seemed to be seeking the best approach to his thesis. He said, what's happening in Antioch must not affect Jerusalem, nor should it seem even related to us in Jerusalem. For as greater and greater numbers of Gentiles join the company of believers, believing Jews are seen less and less as Jews. 
And so this would be the challenge, wouldn't it? If you were born and brought up as a Jewish person, you would see your identity being diminished with yeah. time. Yeah. He looked at me and said, do you agree? I didn't answer. Pity for his own loss nearly forced me to utter sounds of agreement. But my growing sense of isolation among these men and a mistrust of my tongue overcame pity. It's a sad thing, isn't it? He's got mistrust of his own tongue. <laughs> we should be known as Jews, shouldn't we? John said, still looking at me. Not because my brother would not have died, though purely as a Jew he would not have died, but because that is what we are. Isn't that right, James? Simon, desperate at my silence, spoke for me. Of course, of course it's right. We are of Israel with a message for Israel. John turned his eyes towards Simon. Then we also ought to stand with our people, especially now when they are everywhere under threat in the empire. <coughs> Excuse me. Especially now when the favour of the emperor is so arbitrary and unstable. Now is not a time to divide and dilute the Jewish identity, John said, but rather to unify and strengthen it. James, he said, turning his eyes to me, ever and ever to me, you are right. The covenant law has saved us alive for ages and ages, and the covenant law must do so still today. Then let us purify covenant law and make firm our Jewish adherence. By the same token, now is not the time to blur the Jewish face before the world. And so what do they mean when they say the covenant law? Whose covenant law? God's what is the covenant law? God's law. God's law. It's God's covenant with? With um, Noah. Abraham. Abraham. <laughs> okay, so that's what they mean when they say the covenant law. So the law came from Moses, but the covenant was made with Abraham. Mm -hmm. Okay. He paused. He returned his gaze to the lamp flame, again breathing, gathering his thoughts. John has enormous eyes. His manner is ruminative. If you interrupt his talk, you lose his talk. He falls silent. While his brother was alive, John was mostly silent. Now in a voice barely audible, he began to ask a series of questions. What happened to Israel in Alexandria 10 years ago? Barnabas said softly, pogrom. Simon said, synagogues burned to the ground. Mothers and their children murdered, fathers and husbands. It was more than a pogrom, Barnabas, it was a massacre. And the survivors were packed like cattle into ghettos. John's eyes glistened, the lamp flame showed in his tears, John of mortal sympathies. Now down in Alexandria in Egypt, they had a hippodrome there as well. And what actually happened to the Jews, and it's recorded in the book of Maccabees, is that they used to drive elephants into the hippodrome and close the gates. And so these people would all be in the actual hippodrome yeah. and they would um, basically affect the elephants in such a way that they were basically angry and they would go through and they would trample and kill all these people in the hippodrome whilst, yeah. of course, the audience cheered on like it was a sport. And so this is what happened down in Alexandria. Yeah. Uh, so it's absolutely uh, horrific, of course. John's eyes glistened, the lamp showed in his tears, John of mortal sympathies. And what then, he asked of the fire, eight years ago, the emperor wanted to put a statue of himself on the Holy of Holies of the temple. The, ab the ab abomination of desolation was coming again. Saul, perhaps you heard the howls of Jews in those days. For six months, we trembled in anguish here, praying, planning for war, committing our bodies to the death when that statue should actually come. The emperor changed his mind and changed it back and we were saved from horrors only by his assassination. That was Caligula, now we've got Claudius. And the whims of this one are no better than the whims of that. Jews, John said, raising his gaze, must seem to be and Jews must be a visible blood unity everywhere in the purview of the present emperor Claudius. Saul, he said, Barnabas, he said, do you know what happened this year here at the Passover? Because of course they had been away on their mission trip from Antioch across the Cyprus and up into today's Turkey during this time. So they're saying, are you aware of what happened here whilst you were away? 
Barnabas, gazing in his own hands now, said, We heard that people died under the feet of other people running. Yes, John said, Did you hear a figure? Do you know how many people died? No, said Barnabas. John said, Peter does. How many died here, Peter? Simon responded to this catechesis also in a lowly voice and in a complete sentence, ten, oh, sorry, 20,000 pilgrims died. Okay, so this would have been peeled out of the historical documentation in this portion of what's been written. Do you know why, John asked, do you know what created such a terrible stampede of humanity that 20,000 people should perish at the feast of the Passover? No, said Simon, James does. John closed his mouth a moment. The trembling wet fire in his eyes had caused the water to rise in mine. John said, James, why don't you tell them what caused the stampede? Show them the reason for Jewish solidarity in this Roman world. I said, the governor had stationed a regiment in the temple courts to forestall rioting at the feast. It's not an unusual precaution, but this year one soldier, a pagan, uncircumcised, dropped his breeches and exposed himself. I paused and sighed. The pilgrims were stunned at the blasphemy. They cried out with such rage that the governor thought a riot had begun. So he ordered the entire army to swarm the temple mount our people fled in terror, and in the narrow streets of Jerusalem, Jews trampled Jews to death. The circumcised trampled the circumcised to death, while the uncircumcised laughed us to scorn. John's eyes were lost in flame again. He breathed quietly, then he said, And now comes the news from Rome that Claudius is closing synagogues. Roman religion is renewed. Rome detests the superstition of the Jews and the emperor, I hear, is threatening to expel the Jews because of conflict among our people, because of antagonisms made shamefully public. Antagonisms, so I hear over Jesus, Lord, help us, we are inviting the ire of the earthly powers. And so here we are hearing a piece of history where the riots ended up coming to fruition and the Romans went through the land and killed them all until there was none left. Every other Jew fled the land of Judea and there was a place uh, where all of these people fled to and it was the last uh, stand in Judea and so I won't go into that tonight but it's a tragic tragic story mm. and uh, it's a place that we went to in Israel but at the end of the day they just kept going until the Jews were completely killed or they ran away and they became what's known as the diaspora which spread throughout the world only to come back 70 odd years ago, finally into the land of Israel and claim it back as their inheritance from God. And so this is part of that history. Okay. So John said, it doesn't matter to Claudius whether some follow Jesus and others do not. Before Rome, Jews are Jews. Again, he turned his face to me, the rim of his cheek and jaw glowed orange from the single lamp flame. His eye receded into shadow. He said, but Rome perceives a difference between Gentiles and Jews. And a Gentile is a Gentile whether he is circumcised or not. In the eyes of God, there is surely a distinction. So they're still hanging on to this thread. Surely, James, but not in the eyes of Claudius, for the sake of the nation of the faith, he must not see Jews fighting Jews over Jesus. On the other hand, neither must he lose sight of Israel among all the peoples, or we will lose place and privilege in the empire. But I believe that the more Gentiles he sees in mix with Israel, the less will he see Israel at all, James. John said, don't you agree? I nodded. And so they're worried about the dilution of themselves as a race of people under the rule of Rome. And so they want to keep their identity. And so they're using this as a reason to stay circumcised and to rebuff the Gentiles from adding to their number. So with a genuine mercy for me and with affection, which is most destructive of my reserve and my self-control, John placed his hand beside mine on the table and continued, Then you know, don't you, for our sake, for the sake of believers and for the sake of Jews everywhere, we must let Gentiles both seem to be and be Gentiles, exactly as Saul has requested. Now is the time to refine our name, our nation and our face in the world, not to undefine it. This is but one God and one Lord and one Jesus and one Messiah for us all, that is the union all believers have together, whether Jew or Gentile. Nonetheless, before a world that does not know the spirit of the Lord, we faithful will appear divided. We can't change that, but we can turn it to our benefit. 
saw my brother, John said, straightening his neck with a formality of his own. He had arrived at his thesis. Yes, go forth with your gospel to the Gentiles, he said. Go freely, unhindered and unrestrained. Establish churches separate from the synagogues. Likewise, we will keep preaching Jesus in the synagogues to the Jews. Interesting, isn't it? At that part, they parted company and churches became churches and Messianic Jews became Messianic Jews. And it still happens through to today. James, my brother, he said to me, when the crisis and the collapsings come and how can they not come in this world? The divisions of the flesh would divide our people to get all together. Jews would not trust Gentiles, even the, uns- even the circumcised Gentile, to sacrifice their lives for the temple and for the law. Suspicions and internal enmities would aid our enemies and defeat the chosen people. And this became a problem because going forwards in the future, you know, the Christians literally went to war against the Jews throughout history. And they killed one another century after century after century. And that's been the story. Really, the acceptance of Jews and Gentiles together as brothers and sisters is a very, very modern thing. In fact, it's only 20 years old. You know, and so people, for example, who in Christian churches donate money, for example, for Jews to make Alia to return home to their homeland, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that didn't exist and the Jews wouldn't have accepted the money. Mm. But there's been a huge shift where there's an embracing between the two again. Mm. uh, And that is something that's really, really just recent. And so this situation has carried through 2,000 odd years of history. So it's amazing, isn't it? So John stopped. He had run out of words. He touched the back of my hand without looking at me. Then he took his own hand back again. No one spoke. Barnabas had put his head down, laying his brow in the bend of his elbow. Saul was tapping the index finger of his right hand against his temple. I could not read the man's expression, though he must have recognised the effect of John's logic. The way was clear before him now. I would not dispute this final appeal, for I love the temple with all my heart, and I love my people, the Jews. And of course, we know what happened to the temple. Mm. I rose from the table and walked out to the tiny kitchen where Simon's wife was sitting alone in the dark, her hand upon her mouth, the cheeses uneaten beside her. So all her hard work throughout this time has been in vain. Miriam, I said, please bring us some wine. We're nearly done. She said, is it well with us? I paused and said, it will be well. Then returned to the dining room. No one had moved. I don't think anyone had spoken in my absence. I approached Saul and Barnabas from behind, extending my hands to both of them. Saul rose and clasped my right hand in his right hand, smiling. Barnabas, gently for a big man, reached and took the fingers of my left hand in his right. I said, it is done. Tomorrow we will speak to the whole assembly and assure them that as Simon was given good news for the Jews, so you have been given good news for the Gentiles. And so they're accepting that the Messiah is the same for both of them, but they're not accepting that Jews and Gentiles will walk the same path together. I hesitated, not yet releasing Saul's hand. What was I not saying? What would I lose? Losing this propitious moment in which to say it, events had gathered speed today. I I do not think quickly. My thought is circumspect and laborious. What might I regret tomorrow not having said it today? Well, John's description of the trampling death of so many unfortunates rose to mind. Doubtless, I said, there is wealth among the Gentiles. Would Antioch therefore remember the poor in Jerusalem? Now, this is a complete turn because they were bringing wealth down from Antioch to Jerusalem and the Jews there were refusing the money because they come from the Greek Jews. Mm. And here he is now saying there is wealth among the Gentiles. Mm. Would Antioch therefore remember the poor in Jerusalem? Would the churches in Antioch raise money for the survival of the saints in Jerusalem? Mm and send it here to us. So, of course, this is a shift of unity together. Um, It seems it's about money, but at the end of the day, it's there to help the poor. Mm. Reads on, Verily the man being with gladness, Oh, yes, he said, and he kissed my cheek with a moist lip and a scratching chin. He had gladness. One ought not become too glad. It wasn't a victory. It shouldn't be seen as victory. Barnabas remained sitting. Simon's wife arrived with a nicely mulled wine, As she leaned forward to fill the cup of her husband, she breathed the question, Simon, 
what have we done? Mm. And so this is a, you know, it's a significant moment in the history of the church because this is the time, this council that met together in Jerusalem that would form the pathway for both Jews and Gentiles right through history until now. So it's quite extraordinary. Mm. Okay, well, I hope you enjoy that. It's quite fascinating. Um, we will continue on from this point in our next lesson. Uh, just before we go, um, again, here's the map. So here's Jerusalem down here. There's Caesarea. Jaffa is basically right here on the coast. And so they went from Jaffa up to Caesarea in the story of Peter uh, here. And of course, we've got Antioch that they're talking about up here, which is where they're receiving the funds for the church from. And when Paul and Barnabas were away, they traveled from Antioch across to Cyprus up into the land of uh, the region of Galatia in what's today's modern Turkey, returned by a boat back to Antioch and then returned to Jerusalem for this meeting in the home of James. And so this is the map that shows those pathways.